filmmaker in politics and in roles such as creative digital director for the Bernie Sanders 2016 presidential campaign. After his recent move to Berlin here in Germany, he has started a small creative company called Committee focused on countering the narratives of the far right globally. He's working on elections in the Netherlands, Italy and Kosovo where he joins us from tonight. He's there to work on their SNAP elections. Aaron has a presentation to start the conversation and then we'll open it up to you for questions. You can submit questions either through the YouTube chat function or via email to event at americahouse.de. That's the German spelling event at A-M-E-R-I-K-A-H-A-U-S dot D-E. My fantastic partners over there will be monitoring the questions for us and we'll try to get to as many as we can in this one hour that we have. And then in closing, I will say a little bit about what we have planned for our next event in March. So with that, thank you so much for coming Arun, over to Christina and welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really, really pleased to be able to speak with all of you. Uh, and you know, I, I regret not being able to be in Munich with you all uh, in person to talk about this, but there is something fitting uh, about having to have a digital uh, call when we're talking about digital campaigning and when we're talking about how it has so much promise, but often the execution isn't quite right. And we kind of think it's a miraculous thing. And I, I think there's a, a, a lot there that's in parallel. So I'm gonna pop on a, um, a PowerPoint presentation as we do in the American government as well as in the private sector. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about things that we can glean from this last election and things that we can't glean from this last election in the US. So everyone bear with me for one second. And if this doesn't go right, I hope someone will tell me. Share sound, optimize, Let's play from start. How am I doing? Excellent. So look, and I'm guilty of this as the rest of us all are, we say that every single election is the most consequential election. And, and, you know, and this time it really felt true because there couldn't be anything sort of more stark than this return to normalcy cry you see coming up from all over the US in uh, a win for Biden. But at the same time, you see you know, Donald Trump, which is, has been an unusually contentious presidency that has, uh, as Barley was referencing, and in an actual insurrection at the Capitol. Uh, and so it seems like there could be nothing more consequential than the removal of this pseudo tyrant uh, by someone who is more respected in the world and is more emblematic of American values. But that is not true for the practitioners of politics. For us, not only was this election not particularly interesting, no election has been particularly interesting since 1968. What happened in 1968? 1968 is the last time there was a major shift in US politics. This is when racist people decided to become Republicans. Before that, you were more likely than not to be a Democrat or a Republican if you were racist. In 1968, they, made, they put the sign open, it's called the Southern Strategy, you know, and it's Nixon. And this is the last time that messaging has changed in the Democratic and uh, Republican parties. And so I'm gonna show you really quickly two commercials from the 1968 election, one by Richard Nixon and one by his opponent, uh, Hubert Humphrey, that show us this lack of messaging progress. This first one is a classic, by the way, absolute classic. <laughs> It is time for an honest look at the problem of order in the United States. Dissent is a necessary ingredient of change, but in a system of government that provides for peaceful change, there is no cause that justifies resort to violence. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. It's also a great slogan, right? Felt like your whole world depended on it. So that's the Republican side, 1968. Now uh, let's take a look at the Hubert Humphrey ad, which will reference a person named Spiro Agnew. Uh, for those of you who may be younger or maybe a part of our foreign audience, he was uh, Nixon's vice presidential choice uh, and was sort of known to be so corrupt that it was almost laughable, this kind of this, you know, this, this guy from, from Maryland. 
Uh, let me play the ad though. <laughs> and so that's where we're at, right? Uh, the Republicans say, you're all going to die. And the Democrats can say, no, you're ridiculous. And this has been the same back and forth argument that's happened. And no matter what we see happening in terms of policy, in terms of what people believe in, that hasn't changed the party structure at all. You know, you have an election like 2016 in which before Bernie Sanders entered, Donald Trump had adopted traditionally left positions and Hillary Clinton had adopted traditionally right positions, which is a muscular foreign policy and free trade deals, while Donald Trump embraced protectionism and bringing troops home. Uh, and no one cared, nobody noticed. No one was like, wait a minute, the parties have realigned uh, massively. It wasn't that because it's not about the policies, it's about the team that you're on and the feeling that the team gives you. One team says you're all gonna die and the other team says, no, that's crazy. And what we have are elections that over and over again, just take the tactics that maybe have or haven't worked the time before and just do them over and over and over again. And so we have a situation in which we're not really sure how and why people win elections. And that's gonna be the basis of what we're gonna talk about uh, in a frank and earthy way. So look, I'm exaggerating. One interesting thing has happened in the last uh, 20 years and that is the death of broadcast and political advertising, right? The idea that I can force you to watch content because you have no place else to go rather than make content that is so appealing that you can't help but look at it. Like this otter, that is good content. He's wearing 3D glasses. He's adorable. You're gonna click on that. We know how these things work. We meet people where they're at online based on their interests, based on their geography. We always remember to divide people up by class. We remember to divide people up by race. Sometimes we understand these things go together. I'm being a bit mocking here because sometimes we seem to forget they go together. And this is actually a picture of uh, black um, factory workers in Wisconsin who would have made up the entire difference in Hillary Clinton's loss in Wisconsin had they actually voted for her. So you do understand that actually getting race and class right isn't as easy as you think it is and is very important. We understand that numbers are important, but we don't fetishize them because we know digital is not an arms race. It's not about these eye popping numbers. Oh my God, you know, the Sanders campaign made 6 billion phone calls. You're like, but he lost the primary. So maybe 6 billion phone calls doesn't help. But we know all these things to be true. We know elections work. But, and yet, the center left loses a lot of elections and a lot of other elections all across the world are too close. And I wanna directly say uh, to you right now that although we all felt satisfaction uh, this November when Joe Biden won, the election is very, very alarming for the center left generally, globally, and for Democrats. And that Donald Trump actually significantly increased his share of the vote and the Democrats losing House seats in a wave election for, uh, you know, for who was supposed to be their popular, popular presidential candidate shows that there's something very wrong in the system. Uh, if, if you're asking me right now, I would say put any amount of money on the Republicans taking the House back in 2022 because of this. But what we have is a situation that I call Schrodinger's campaign. This is Schrodinger's cat, you can see the cat's there, in which we have campaigns that simultaneously work and don't work at the same time. You know, before this guy, uh, <laughs> Ossoff, uh, was pulled across the finish line by uh, Raphael Warnock uh, to win Georgia, he ran the most expensive campaign in Georgia history for the House, for a House seat. A House seat in which he lost by the same percentage points that someone in the district next to him lost by, and he spent $60 million and they spent $35 thousand dollars. I want to make sure we understand that's millions versus thousands. And yet the electoral result was the same. We know that television is simultaneously the most effective way to reach the most important segment of voters, old people. Uh, and we also know that nobody really watches television. That's incredibly expensive. So we have to hold both these things as being true if we believe it. 
we know that field is only worth at most five points at the end of the day. Like when you hear someone say a, something is within a field margin, that means you could have won if you'd knocked on more doors. Uh, we know that this is only worth three to five to six points. And yet the amount of money that you invest to do it becomes prohibitive unless you start bringing in people from all over the country. And, and this is the really sad thing because we in America, and this is something we export to politicians all over the world, is this idea of like nice, ha happy young people knocking on doors and being engaged politically. We have a lot of data to suggest that actually when you show up in a place that you're not from and you don't look or talk or act like people in that place, that your door knock is actually counterproductive. It does not make sense to send volunteers across the country. People who wanted to go to Georgia, for instance, in this you know, crucial Senate election should have been turned away at the border by like Democrats being like, just go home to wherever the hell you're from and send me five bucks. But even though we don't know if these things work, we just industrialize them. We say full steam ahead. So like if one phone call is good, then a million phone calls is better. If one door knock is good, then a million are better. It doesn't matter where they come from. And that's where you get really kind of messy campaigns like Beto works in 2018. Maybe we can talk about that a bit, but I don't want to get bogged down in Beto. So the question, which America did twice, all right? We got bogged down in Beto twice. It's not going to happen on my watch here tonight. Uh, but the question we should be asking ourselves is, do campaigns even work? Is campaigning a thing? And the jury is out. Here's a hint. Whenever we say to each other at meetings like this or at cocktail parties or with, you know, with our learned friends, and we say things like, the voters don't know what's going on. They behave irrationally. They don't do things in their self-interest. Maybe that's true, but it reminds me of what you say in Madison Avenue, which is that sometimes it's the dog and sometimes it's the dog food. When the dog won't eat the dog food on camera for your dog food commercial, you can't always blame the dog. Sometimes what you're feeding it is garbage. And the other thing it's hard for us to remember is that <clears throat> politics is a pendulum. It really does swing back and forth. And because of the way the media covers it, every time, you know, say Biden wins the election, which he did, now people are immediately talking about, this is the coalition that helped Joe Biden win. This is now the democratic coalition for the next 20 years. Uh, and it's just not true. People flip back and forth. The one of the reasons that the Republicans are probably gonna take the house back is that it's their turn. One of the reasons Donald Trump won against Hillary Clinton was that it was the Republicans turn. Things do shift back and forth. Uh, and we don't know where we're at as the non-sentient ball in the pendulum. And what I mean by that is we can't always be surprised when we lose because it's time to lose. You know, the ball doesn't always stay on that, on that one thing. And this goes back a bit, look at young Obama. What do y'all think? Look at that young guy. Uh, has a lot to do with the fact that when digital practices, when the thing that when you, any of you hire, for instance, an email person or digital advertiser, the thing that they think of as being the normal orthodox thing to do is actually based on Barack Obama's re-election, not even his election. It's based on 2012 and not 2008. And that's a problem because you can't run re-elections unless you're already the president. This doesn't work. This really didn't work for Hillary Clinton in 2016. And this also didn't work for Bernie Sanders in 2020. I want to be equal opportunity here. He sort of ran his presidential campaign like he had already been president and this was all just getting the band back together. And that's not where it's at. That's not what it is. You can't fight a re-election if you've never been elected. So we're reaching a point at which political parties are essentially business conglomerates. There's a certain amount of money being put into the system. There's a certain number of companies who do the things that people like I do and they have to divide up the pie. And the pie doesn't get any binger because we don't bring new people in. The Democrat uh, consultant industrial complex, of which I guess I'm proudly a member, we'll make pins maybe, uh, is made to do one thing and one thing only, and that's turn out likely Democratic voters, likely Democratic voters. And this is the death nail of the Democratic Party. If you're only pulling out the people who you think are the most likely to vote for you, this works in elections where you don't have a lot of people coming out and where you don't have low propensity voters coming out, which is singularly, singularly Donald Trump's talent. 
I think I told Barley we weren't going to talk about Trump that much. I apologize to you right off the top. But this is his actual singular talent is bringing people up off the benches who were like, why would I bother? And this is also the answer for your like, but he didn't give them any of the things he said he would. He went back on every promise. He didn't manage to solve anything. You're not getting why those people came off the sideline. They came off the sideline because they don't like the likely voters because they want to prove all these people wrong and actually not getting anything done was part of the program. Primaries have value. There's a reason that we have competitive primaries, right? We had the most competitive primary in the history of the Democratic Party. You probably don't remember half of these people. Uh, along with at least, at least half of these folks had what I would consider to be competent, smart digital programs, which is not something that if you're not a first year candidate, you would have had until this election, which is great that people are investing but it doesn't quite work. And we're not doing the thing primaries are meant to do, which is to match messengers to messages. If we were, we would have spent a lot less time making fun of the incomparable Marion Williamson, who was probably the most interesting candidate to run and was immediately dismissed by the democratic establishment as being foofy, as being stupid, as being silly. Are you even a Democrat? When she's the one who can talk to Republican housewives who have a slight new age bent, but actually want to see justice done and don't like Trump. She was the messenger for that. Not Joe Biden, somebody who's like, you know, 40 years in politics. Joe Biden may have been the right candidate to be the person, but what you want in a primary is for Marion Williamson to have been allowed to participate fully to bring in new people to become new Democrats and then you hand that over to the primary winner. This is the theory of primary. It sounds obvious when I say it, but you know, Andrew Yang brought in a lot of Asian folks and people who really like math. Like you wanna add all those people into the pile. You wanna make the pile bigger and then give the whole pile over to the winner of the primary. The most interesting thing to happen in this primary did not happen for any of our young folks. It happened from Ed Markey, uh, the current, uh, junior or senior senator, senior senator from Massachusetts, uh, who through relation became internet famous through not just a really great program with excellent memes that the kids loved, but also through a program called Relational Organizing, which is probably the only interesting thing that's come out of 2020 was doing that at scale. Relational organizing is the idea that you as a volunteer for a campaign shouldn't be calling strangers on the phone you as a volunteer for a campaign shouldn't be knocking on people's doors that actually no one cares what you think about really in the public discourse, except there's like 45 people, 50 people, maybe only 20 people, but people in your life who actually give a crap what you think. Not only do they give a crap what you think, they will give a crap enough about it that they will change their vote just because you asked. You know, Uncle Donnie, why are you voting for, for Trump? You know, and it's like, ah, eh, you know, yes, nicely, so I won't. This actually has a much higher success rate uh, than a lot of phone banking activity. And so, and so the real holy grail is, of course, when you can get this done at scale. So when I set up a phone bank, and I, and I, as I hope a lot of you, uh, especially who are expats, were able to do through Democrats Abroad and through a lot of other great um, organizations to call back home to people, the best way to have that be set up is not with an auto dialer and a script to talk to whoever you end up talking to. It's actually for you to sit down in the office and have tools given to you that scrape your contacts and your phone and make it easy for you to contact your people. Because again, your people care what you think. They're your people. Why wouldn't you be the ambassador to the people who care about you? And so while it is ironic that these two old guys kind of push the relational organizing model to, you know, now where it is, and I think a lot of people in Georgia would say that relational organizing had a lot to do with the victory there, it's actually an even older guy who you also didn't hear of during the primaries who did something very interesting, which was Senator Mike Gravel. And he ran such a successful insurgent campaign that, mind you, was run by teenagers. They were both 19. They called them the Gravel teens that he was supposed to be led into the debates, but they had to make up reasons not to because Gravel famously, and, and I would encourage you all to look up on YouTube, his 2008 debate performances, which are legendary. He lets everybody have it. Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, everyone who you care about in the Democratic Party just gets it from Mike Gravel. This, you know, he is 
significantly older and crankier than Bernie Sanders. I just want to give you all a good idea of who this man is. Uh, but he empowered Generation Z, the Zoomers, to actually get involved in politics. And like I said, should have been led onto the debate, the debate stage just on the strength of donations and polling that he did in under 25s. People, so that's another thing I just want to point out from this was something interesting that happened, but we don't really talk about it in the primary. So again, Senator Mike Gravel should have been the one, if he had been treated more seriously, would have delivered some of that younger vote that just didn't turn out again, right? This mysterious youth vote that we never can quite seem to get over the top. This was our man to get them. But that's fine. You go to war with the army you have, not the army you would wish for, as our great ex-defense secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, once said. And with uh, Joe Biden, he may not have been the biggest digital crazy insider, but because he didn't have a lot of digital infrastructure, he did make room for other people to do their own thing in support of him. And this is where you see state groups, where you see Stacey Abrams, where you see all these sort of independent organizing groups being so much more effective because there wasn't some kind of crazy Death Star top-down digital program. So in a way, this was helpful. Like in the way people complain that Obama had too much control with his digital program, and then when it became OFA, it didn't necessarily lead to legislative wins. A lot of people think that's because there was this sort of central control. Well, here with Biden, you have a more of a vacuum there, and so people were able to step in. One of those people who stepped in was me. Uh, I wondered what I would do this election, and I actually decided that I was going to do one thing. You know, I was in Germany, and I'm busy, and I'm doing all these things. Um, and so I had a, a footage that I had shot of Joe Biden at the March for Our Lives um, rally with the kids from Parkland School. It was a very touching moment that I will show you here in one sec uh, that we filmed with, with Joe Biden. And I knew this was the good stuff. And it wasn't that I was the only person who remembered that I had shot this. I had shot this for a group, ARS, that's Gabby Gifford's uh, gun group, if you know her. Other people had put it into things, but they'd all done it wrong and they'd all done it too soon. So I had a post-it note that said, October 22nd, release the video, which is two weeks before the election. And I waited and I didn't do anything until it was October 22nd, and then I released the video. And that's this video. Who are the parents? Yeah. 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 I'm white. I'm Chris Hudson's wife. God love you. Thank you. I wanted to. Okay. This is Chris's I'm son. I'm Well, how are you? Aww. Thank you for hugging me. Mm. You okay? You okay? You'll be okay. We're gonna be okay. We're gonna be okay. I promise. Okay, I promise. You know, in the propaganda game, we say don't get high in your own supply, but like I get feelings even every time that I still, when I, when I watch this video, because it really, you know, it gets at the truth of Joe Biden as an empathetic figure. And also the kind of we're gonna be okay message is obviously one that America is craving in a huge way. So you knew you had a hit on your hands, but you have to release it at the right time, which to, to my expertise was two weeks before, but more importantly, I released it in a different kind of way, which was not edited, no graphics, and with a call to action of make your own thing from this. And so uh, we got 13 million views on the raw clip alone, but then by the time it was done, a bunch of super PACs had made uh, ads out of it, uh, a bunch of uh, gun uh, control groups, I don't, we don't call them gun control groups anymore, but anyway, had made some successful ads out of it. And this actually one piece put out two weeks before has been seen by more people than any other single piece of content from the entire election by far. And in fact, actually, if you add up even all of Biden's professional like, you know, home done videos is more than those. And so it shows you that this kind of insider outsider content strategy is different in the digital age. Again, it's matching the message to the messenger. This same video put out from the Biden campaign with a thing in the beginning where Joe Biden's like, I just wanted you to see this thing I did once and a call to action at the end, send us five bucks. Like every little thing you do, like just sort of chips away at the authenticity of it. And what sort of YouTube audiences such as yourself tonight demand is that authenticity. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. So what we're witnessing here is electoral successes, but the failure of a business model. And this is the thing that we really hope that we can correct soon. Because the democratic digital establishment, again, I include myself in this, 
we're made to address conditions on the ground. The, you know, and when you win an election, you're like, that was great. And when you lose, you're like, the, it just wasn't right. It wasn't the right year for this candidate or everything was going against us. This isn't what Republicans do. They tilt the table. You know, <laughs> like you, you saw like Donald Trump when he was flailing around at the end of the election, kind of all of a sudden he's talking about Hillary Clinton. Now he's talking about the stock market again. You're like, no one wants to talk about anything other than the pandemic. So what are you doing, man? He was trying to do this. He was like, I literally cannot win this election if it's about COVID. It has to be about something else. I can't play the game the way the game is set up and win. I need to tilt the table, to upend the table. And because Democrats, we are always set up to fight a symmetrical war. We always are set up like it's an election. We have two sides. We do our things. And this is not how the other side does it. And it's also not sustainable. You know, when we think about the, one of the great breakthroughs in, um, in campaigning, it's been small dollar donations, right? The idea of a Bernie Sanders only exists in a world in which people can give small amounts of money. Barack Obama could have kept up with Hillary Clinton in 2008 in the primary, but he was able to eclipse her money wise because of low dollar donations. But you don't win all those elections. And so all of a sudden the morality of when you're losing a lot of elections to still be asking people for the last five bucks when you're actually going up against people who have infinite money starts to sound like a losing proposition in a lot of ways. So what is to be done? To quote Comrade Lenin very quickly. Uh, we need to break out of politics. What do I mean by that? I mean, we gotta become unstuck from elections. Elections are the worst. When I come up on your door and it's an and I'm like, it's election time and I'm here from the local democratic party. I don't know if you can count on your vote. People are just like, get out of here. I don't wanna to talk to you about this. Do you know when people are interested in policy are interested in political issues? Any other time, because it doesn't seem like you have something to get out of it. It's like, you just want a job. That's why you want my vote. You just want my vote because you want power. You have to be able to tell that story outside of elections. And that's what digital is good at, letting you escape from the news cycle and engage in future thinking, right? Um, actually, we're gonna, I'm gonna skip some of this because politics is happening all around you all the time, whether or not you want it to be. There's not a good time to do an election. So let me give you an example. Um, we take a, 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 an election in 2000 and what was it, 10? Uh, uh, a man named Scott Walker became a governor of Wisconsin. I actually thought he would, was gonna be the Republican nominee in 2016 at first. So we dodged a bullet there. He's this real kind of Nixonian uh, bad guy, uh, did a lot of horrible things in Wisconsin. They almost recalled him. When he won, Republicans were playing this stupid game that I'm saying Democrats play. They're like, oh, he did so many smart things and that's why he won. And Scott Walker has a new model for winning, but that's not why he won. He won because for decades, for say 40 or 50 years, High dollar donors like the Koch brothers were telling stories, were telling stories about how unions were bad and about how you had a right to work and how are these people from big cities coming to your town and telling you how to live your life and making you fork over union dues. That uh, is, a, and, they, and they didn't have an ulterior motive for telling that story. It was a pamphlet, it's a door knock, it's a phone call, it's a conversation, it's video, it's audio, it's op-eds but it's not electioneering. And so you're doing it just because you think it's right. And so when people are taking that information in, they tend to believe it more. And then when an elected official comes along and is like, you know, I'm thinking these unions, they're bad. We should, I'm running against the unions. The fact that people were receptive to that message was not because he in one fell moment had like changed the equation. It was because for 40 years, we got this organizing and message storytelling from the Koch brothers. And so Democrats need to do more about telling the story of their values and their policies, even when it's not an election. P.S. This is something that Stacey Abrams and a lot of other folks like that, and we use her as a shorthand, which isn't fair to a lot of other people who are very hardworking uh, in, the, in the sphere, but to people who, again, it was an election time. She was like, nah, I'm gonna hang back in Georgia and just organize people here now. Not for anything specifically, just for their own lives. This is the point I'm trying to make. It's always, it's always campaign season to someone. And if you're taking time off, you're not doing it right. Okay, so we wanna engage in asymmetrical warfare. That means we need to ask people again, not just about voting and about elections, but about other things. 
You know, the way that we kind of think about our voters is that they're worth a phone call, they're worth a donation, they're worth their vote. These are the smallest things we could be asking instead of asking like, what is it that you do? What do you do for a living? How can I put that? Oh, you're a filmmaker? Oh, you're an author? Can you include some of this messaging in the work that you're doing? Forget like, can you come write a commercial for me? No, can you actually infuse the work that the party is doing into the work that you're doing. It has to work both ways like that. It can't always be an election and it can't always be sort of politics is fun. And the other thing that we have to do is let working class people into the political system. This is just something that has not happened. Uh, and literally, it's so sad that if you go to like Albany in New York state and go to like the legislator, they have a book about, so you wanna run for things. It's like a very cute kind of kids comic. And it says, so you want to run for something. And it even has pictures of the jobs you should have had beforehand before you run, which are like lawyer and doctor and other just professional groups. We don't take working class people seriously. And when we do, we fetishize them. Oh my God, AOC is a bartender. AOC is a bartender. AOC is a bartender. How many times have you heard that? So we have this gentrification happening in the party that will continue to keep this small group of likely democratic voters that we have smaller and smaller and smaller. So we have a lot to celebrate this year. We've come a long way. Uh, the things that were happening in the US under Donald Trump, some of which were unthinkable and unspeakable are, are now over. But not only do we need, you know, for those of me who are progressives need to like, you know, push the party to do things that we want, but we also need to start telling stories about the things we want when it's not convenient, when it's not easy, and when there's not an immediate gain for us. And with that, I would just love to take any questions that y'all have. Thank you. Well, that, that took the exact right fun. amount of time. Nice. That was perfect. That was fun. Thank you. Um, you know what, you finished on the gentrification and then of course what immediately came to my mind is that that must not be the case with the Republicans if we're looking at Lauren Boebert and Marjorie. No, they have this incredible bench. They've got women, they've got, you know, working class people, they have like all kinds of different people running. Like, and literally you have a leadership of the House and the Democrats who are all over 80. And when you say, can you point us towards someone else? They're like, no, not really. And you're being ageist. Like, you know, like how is it that the party that supposedly is for the values of young people can never find a convenient time to promote any of those young people? It's a real problem. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens now that they have all the power, who they put in the various positions, I guess. Speaking of that, you said that content is really different for millennials, for Gen X, for Gen Z. Could you expand on that with examples? Sure. Like, you know, oftentimes when I'm making uh, a video, I'm definitely thinking about like who the audience is. And so let's like, I'll just break down three. So they're Gen X or maybe even uh, boomers, uh, but like sort of like angry dads, right? They're in the center. Uh, they could be convinced to vote either way, but it's gotta be for like a real argument, you know? Like, and it's gotta be like some, even if it doesn't totally make sense, it has to be presented in a certain way. And so I will always make a closing argument for those folks that is essentially the best version of the candidate stump speech. So just what they believe, you know, like the simplest way, and then you show them, and this is when you use those kind of very obvious pieces of B-roll. This is when you see that same windmill, windmill farm in Nevada you see in every other video. You know, but that's okay. This content's not shooting for some kind of crazy goal. It's just, you need to check all the boxes so that somebody who's like, well, they didn't even check all the boxes can be like, well, they checked all the boxes, okay. Uh, then you have a, a millennial audience who, and I love our millennials and they get bashed on, um, they get bashed online a lot, especially by the boomers. And as a Gen X person, seeing people fight like that makes us very nervous as kind of latchkey kids whose parents are all divorced. Uh, but but uh, there has to be something a bit sweet in it for millennials, which you think would be for older people, but it's not true. There needs to be a kind of a, a moral component. You have to come out feeling good. like the millennials need a little bit of heroin pumped into their propaganda. They need a little bit of feel good juice in there. It's about someone who looks like them volunteering. We're gonna change the world. It's, Gen Z does not believe this. 
Gen Z does not, they're, they're older brothers and sisters in the millennials. They are not like this at all. They have a much more sardonic view of the world and a take no prisoners approach online. So the stuff you saw coming out of their Gravel campaign, and it's again, it's easy to dismiss it because the mainstream media did, but this is a person who got enough individual donations that he should have been led on the debate stage, which is not an easy thing to do. You get 100,000 different people to like give you a donation. Like this is, this is tricky. Uh, and was able to do it in this really like take no prisoners, very aggressive Yankee imperialist scum. Like the t-shirts they sent were like straight out of like Maoist bookstores. Uh, and then they, you know, I think raised most of their money selling rolling papers. Famously, Mike Ravel is, uh, uh, is the one who released the Pentagon Papers when he was in, um, when he was the Senator, uh, which was a, a big uh, whistleblowing event in Vietnam. So yeah, there's something fun here, but there is none of that fear that what I'm doing will backfire. It's absolutely just unengaged, pure. It feels nihilistic, but it's not. And we're gonna start seeing a lot more of this. And it's so, for you and I, it is so much more alien than we're used to seeing that I, I, you know, sometimes they send me things. I was like, I don't even know what this is. He's shooting laser beams out of his eyes and you're saying something about dead cops and like, I'm not totally following. And they'd be like, nah, you don't get it. It's not about that. And I think with, not with millennials, but with the Zoomers, we're seeing what actually online, digital, pure mainline engagement will look like in the future when it's not just the old grammar, but put online, but actually an entirely new grammar that has new levels of what's polite and not polite. Okay, we're starting to get some questions about outside the US, but I wanna make sure we cover the US before we move on. Um, in a country where 40% of people don't vote, you have argued that we don't need a bigger tent, we need to reach the non-voters. Yes. Right. And yes. now yesterday it came out that some like 10% of the people in the insurrection in January 6th didn't even vote. Totally. So how do you get to people, the, these, these people? I, I think with different kind of messaging and number one, you don't do it by asking them for their vote right off the top. Do you know what I mean? This is sort of like a, a, a democratic sickness, an American sickness, plus a democratic party sickness where you don't wanna just be right. You wanna be acknowledged to be right. And then the person really ought to thank you because you educated them. You know, it's like America wasn't gonna leave Iraq until they actually thanked us for invading them. You know, like we were never like, once they finally said, thank you, it's like, okay, we'll pull the troops out. We didn't even wanna be here, but you know, like, thank you for thanking us. Uh, this is sort of uh, the, the way that it is. And so immediately you need to change that attitude of somebody being like, oh, I'm so excited about this to being like, ah, crap. Do I really have to vote for the Democrats? You know, I have a special needs kid. I've watched this movie about how policy can help special needs people. Am I really gonna have to vote for Joe Biden? I didn't wanna do that. Like that's real growth for the party is when those people are like, fine, screw it, I'll vote for you. I don't like you, but I will. Because if you want them to like you, it's not gonna happen because they already don't and they're already turned off to politics. And there's sort of, this is what makes sort of the Trumpian movement so flummoxing and hard to deal with, is that you're talking to people who they don't care about the substance being a right or wrong, they just like the way it's making them feel. So one thing is let's stop pretending politics is so fun and so awesome. Let's like stop quoting the West Wing. Let's like not make the conventions these horrible things with like donkeys and these hats and all these things people are like, oh, isn't it great? If you're a non-voter, that's not great. Those people look like losers. That looks like not a good time. What are they doing? Why is one an elephant and one a donkey? Why are you all wearing these hats? Like it doesn't appeal to them. And uh, so that's sort of a, a general one. But then when it comes to even more specific things, I would say that getting out the vote has been something that the period of get out the vote with, especially with mail in voting has been increasing and increasing. And that's when you switch from persuasion from telling someone the things that the party is offering and you switched into being like, have you made a plan to vote? Voting is great, you're gonna get a sticker. For some people, voting's not great and it's not fun and it's not awesome. <laughs> and like, yeah, it seems free and it seems like you should do it, it's easy. But it, it, the actual more that you try to say, this is gonna be great, you're gonna love it, the less those people believe you. It's like telling them I like some band they don't like and being like, well, you're gonna like it if you just go to the concert. It's like, I'm not going to that concert. So I do think it's about number one, uh, I think non-voters need to be told that they're not stupid. 
which is something that you hear from mainstream media as well as party leadership. I don't even want to talk about these people who have made up their minds yet, you know? And then you have a media who's focused on undecided voters who are just people in Iowa who are pretending so they can be on TV that they haven't made up their minds up instead of talking to non-voters. When was the last time you saw a reporter walk up and be like, hey, you're gonna vote? So they'd be like, no, I've been like, why? What would it take to get you to vote? Nobody's interested. I will give you an example that's less extreme, um, but it involves me, so it's personal. I'm not a Democrat. I'm an independent voter. I've never been a Democrat. I have worked with Democrats. I have voted for Democrats uh, for years, about 15 years now, however long it's been. Not one time has anyone asked me why I'm not in the party and what it would take to join. Not a single time. No one was curious. I mean, that's incredible when you think about it, right? 15 years and no one's asked me once. It should be an honor to be in the party. It ain't an honor for a lot of people. They're not into it. Also, put all that aside, we could make it a lot easier for people to vote. There's not, there'd be no reason not to have automatic registration. There's no reason to make people wait in lines to go places. And that stuff, you and I know, is not an accident. It happens right. in certain places at certain times to certain people. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about non-voters. I'm talking about people right. now, not as much, but I used to call them daily show voters. People who like literally watch a program about politics every night, you know? But I know most of them aren't voting because they're, in the demographic that I can look it up and be like, yeah, none of you voted, all you 25 year olds. Y'all watch the show. Y'all agree with a certain point of view, but you didn't pull the trigger. Mm. But we got to stop vilifying them and start asking them what it is that they want and then trying right, to right. deliver it. Sorry, that yeah, was, but, I did a No, bit that's okay. That was certainly, certainly was a huge part of Brexit, that, that whole, the youth that didn't vote, but totally. watched it. So um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions because um, you recently moved to Berlin. So you are a pretty new expatriated American. Mm -hmm. um, many people in our community are Americans living abroad. And so I have two questions I'll pack together. I was going to ask you if being an American outside the country has changed your ideas about campaigning and content. And I have a question from the audience that says the constant campaign seems President Erdogan's AKP winning formula. Mm. In that mm -hmm. vein, do you have any thoughts on running against soft or hard authoritarians outside the U.S.? This is this is great and a uh, uh, great question. And and, be, and it does remind me of the first half because I'm going to get sucked into the second half right now, which is uh, Turkey. It's tough. Uh, it, a lot of these tactics we're talking about and online and storytelling. This is how you defeat a soft authoritarian. Authoritarian. This is absolutely how you do it a light dose of ridicule, you know, but just enough to make them mad, not to make their supporters mad. And then mostly just sort of really humble, like, what can I do for you stuff? Um, but the problem is how digital actually works. It's not magic, right? It actually is platforms and websites. And so before the constitutional referendum, I was actually talking to folks on the ground in Turkey and we made an entire ad plan significant money that a lot of people are willing to put into it in order to, to really like try to drive out the vote. And in the end, no one was willing to put their name on a website that would be, you can't run Facebook ads without having a website because they didn't want to be in, you know, uh, on the list of Erdogan's enemies. And that is part of the problem. So I do think that like a lot of the storytelling tactics that we're talking about is absolutely absolutely the number one way to push back soft authoritarianism because all they're doing is telling stories and have people believe them and then using their platform to tell, to tell more and more stories. But I think it also de-radicalizes folks. The same thing that makes somebody join ISIS or something again is that they're telling a story and the other side is saying, don't you want to go to college and be normal? They're not telling you like a story. They're not telling you a thing that you can be. And so uh, I, I do think that we need to make sure that digital infrastructure has enough transparency and ability to go into places where it's not as welcome and to make sure like as US citizens or as European citizens that in these trade deals we do with some of these countries that we actually include that stuff in there because right now quite the opposite is happening. Like they're the ones kind of slipping in the, can we have an extra kind of get out of jail free on Facebook card thrown in there? And the answer seems to be more often than not, yes. Uh, but the broader question uh, uh, about what is happening is, I think I've always been someone who's been very interested in foreign policy and foreign politics, even as much, if not more than domestic before joining Obama. And so I've 
always, you know, in, in, in that American way that we ignore things hadn't been there, but it had occurred to me very early on, uh, and especially after Brexit, that we're just so America centric in how we think about these things. And we're like, oh, this is happening here. Or we figured out a new thing on the internet. So now I need to come to Europe and teach everyone how to do that. That's not why I'm in Europe, right? It's not because we know how to use email better. And so I need to come over here and tell everyone how to use email better. It's actually because the way the global weather and kind of like right wing dynamic works is that Europe sneezes and America catches the cold. I think there's no question that Donald Trump would not have won the election without Brexit winning first. And I actually think that there is this very broad process happening in the world where there is two flavors of right-wing extremism coming across this world. One of them is very traditional, top-down, handed down like a, a hunting rifle from father to son. Uh, in, in a, in a, and I say father to son very advisedly. I do think it's very gendered. And then you have this kind of happy-go-lucky camp fascism, right? Are we Nazis? I'm not sure. Like, we're just having fun. It's just a frog. It's just QAnon. It's not like, you know, it's not, none of it's a big deal. Uh, I'm not, it's not my identity being racist. It's just a thing that I do sometimes. Um, kind of like cabaret Nazism. So this, these two things come together in Europe. Let's pretend that they're weather fronts. And where they join together is not in the US where things are remarkably stable or in Russia where things are remarkably stable. The place that's instable is the middle of Europe. If you go down from Scandinavia, you know, all the way to the tip of uh, Italy, you can sort of make a line and just talk about how the politics is bizarre in these places because you have the kind of happy-go-lucky fascism and uh, traditional fascism swirling together. So like in Scandinavia, you have like Denmark, where you have perfectly reasonable leftists who now are having a zero immigration policy next door. And yes, I know all of our Scandinavian friends, you are all very different, but no, you're not different <laughs> enough to justify <laughs> that the, the difference between the Swedish Social Democratic Party and the Danish Democratic Party, Social Democratic Party. They are reacting to the same impulse, very different. You have Italy, uh, where like Salvini is sort of the perfect embodiment of, he is both the Nixonian angry dad coming home from work, slapping the kids around, going to sleep. And is also the guy in the bathing suit, you know, having a good time. Like we're just, and that's sort of why some of that stuff is so dangerous because it's sort of showing both these things at the same time. And then you have Germany where of course it's sort of almost like little lightning strikes the weather there, right? You know, you have AFD coming through the top at the same time as you have like the green party doing so well. And this sort of, rot of the SPD seeming to be intractable. I mean, at this point, uh, I don't want to say anything negative to any of my SPD friends, and I would certainly love to talk to you all on like a more basic thing, but we wonder if the patient is possible to revive at some point. You know, the, it has been so, so off the sidelines for so long, or so on the sidelines for so long. So I actually think Europe is where you solve a problem like the right-wing uh, extremism. And I think America will follow uh, and that America does follow. That was again, a long answer to a simple question. So I apologize. No, no, that was good. I think one of the points that you made uh, in that is that we need healthy parties on both sides of the middle. And uh, you know, the, the, in Germany, we've got the SPD that's just down in the dumps with their numbers. Um, and like you said, it's hard to see them, how they get out of it. And in the same token, it's hard to see where the Republican Party is going in the United States right now. It could go sort of two different ways. Um, but, you know, for the Democrats to be strong, they need a strong sparring partner, a sane, sane, strong sparring partner, I would say, right? Well, actual loyal opposition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. so much about. Um, somebody has just written in, how do you think about people getting tired of constant campaigning? Might that not make people turn away from politics even more? Totally. So what are we going to campaign on, right? Join the party, vote for me. We're having a potluck. We're all going to wear hats. If so, I would agree with the questioner. Yeah, no, that's not going to help. I mean, constant campaigning on issues. It's always time to talk to someone about an issue they care about. You know, we often talk about single issue voters in the states because, you know, things can get so crazy in legislation. And so somebody like uh, who's very into abortion uh, or very against guns or yeah. the opposite of those things, they tend to vote on this issue more because they're more passionate about it. It's that way for everybody. Everybody votes on one issue when they actually go into the booth. It's not this whole kind of 
you know, patois of all the things that somebody thinks. The reasons that education and healthcare always poll so highly is because all across the world is because there's always someone who's dealing with a healthcare issue, always someone who's dealing with an education issue or someone very close in their family. And so we also have to not just reach out to people on these big issues we know about, but also on the smaller things they actually care about. Let me give you other examples of like ways that I would segment some of the storytelling in non-election years. I would talk to bike people about what the bike people need. As we know, the bike people love only one thing and that's bikes. The slow food people, <laughs> slow food, diabetics. They wanna hear about, you know, there are populations of people who care about one issue uh, more than others. And if they can, and if you're not gonna have enough time to talk to everyone about their issue during a campaign, but not during a campaign, you do have time to talk about that. So I may not be bombarding you individually with things that even gum on your co on your radar because I'm an online gambling fanatic. And so I didn't pay attention when the party was talking about uh, the Green New Deal and how they're gonna help people with diabetes and these other issues that I've made up, animal people. Animal <laughs> people only vote on animals. I don't even know why I, I should have said that one first. Animal people. Um, uh, vote issues you care about. Uh, it's, I know they're talking about real issues. It's not about a campaign, but it didn't bother me because it just didn't come across my radar. And then when they're finally talking about online gambling, they absolutely have my attention. So I mean, permanent campaigning from a party structure, but I think you still are thinking about the audience experience as something, as kind of content that will either just run off you unless it will take root and bombarding people with how it's time to sign up for something. I need you to have a newsletter. I need you to like send me five bucks. That kind of campaigning, yes, incredibly tiring. I know, especially our expat friends, we sign up for every email list because we are so far away. And boy, y'all regretted that in Georgia, right? Those were some bad emails and they came in thick. If you weren't sick of politics by the time that the Georgia election was done, you were actually literally not a human being. You are a machine. <laughs> so, okay. And I it's a tactic. Question. It's yeah. a tactic. It's a tactic in Israel, it's a tactic in Texas. If we have a zillion elections, people will get tired of it. And certain people who are lower propensity voters will not come out. Let's just keep having more and more and more and more and more and more elections. People don't like it. Voting is a chore, it's not like fun, you know? Yeah, you have to make it fun. <laughs> yeah, That's, well, Australia has right? mandatory voting, but they also give you the free sausage. So I feel like- I, Thing here, right? They really have I their was fingers. going to bring up the free sausage. Exactly. So, okay, on a slightly, but goes against that, you've noted that politics in the US is not based on policy, but rather on teams and postures and attitudes. And so, if Americans are only going to vote for their team, I suppose, does campaigning, does campaigning have any value or are you gonna get them when you talk about animals? We've got to decouple politics from the team and that's a very concerted storytelling effort. So yeah, I think it's, and I mean, there even, it sounds so simple when I say like, here's the formula, uh, but I don't have a better one and we're all here, nice people talking about it. So let's talk about the formula that I've especially been using in Europe. Uh, one of those things that actually will have started here and then we'll apply it back next election to the US, but is sort of using the party uh, and the same we were talking about before or the candidate as the destination, as I call it. So a video comes up, it's a compelling person, uh, single mother, make, again, special needs kid. We just hear about their lives, that's hard, I'm hooked. The second act, and maybe it's not even the same piece of content, right? Maybe it's actually later this woman pops up again and she's like, you know, there's actually a policy that would help my kid. And this is what it's called. And actually neither party is for, right? Whatever it is. And only at the end, you know, do you have this sort of, so you can go on the journey with this person as it's like, you know, the only way that we can really make this happen is to vote for labor, is to vote for the Democrats, is to vote for the PD. Uh, and again, to elicit that attitude of crap, if I care about this thing, then I have to vote for this team. I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna think of myself. I don't identify as being this, yet that's still how I'm gonna vote this time around. Uh, because the thing that I care about right now, they've actually been talking about and addressing, and now I'm willing to, to shop around for your team. Uh, like, again, I don't think like, 
the, the, the example of like working class folks in Wisconsin who repudiated unionism, which is like in their life's blood, it, it's not because they all of a sudden fell in love with the idea of these kind of cigar rolling rich Republicans and were like, oh, I wanna be rich like that. That's not it at all. It's just that people who they trust and voices who they trust were saying like, this other team isn't your thing. This other team is doing something bad to you policy wise. You may think they're nice, you may like their barbecues, but they're actually stealing work from you under the guise of union of trade unionism. And that's the message. And it works. And it works. And yeah. it works. So inside, if you limit yourself to inside the campaigning, then yeah, what are you gonna do except here's my team, vote for my team. That's why, you know, I understand the other question about like permanent campaigning sounds exhausting. But we just do need to decouple the idea that the only time we have political conversations is when there is someone's political job at stake because the rest of us think, isn't that nice for you? You have a job for the next four years. Like, what about the rest of us? No, it'd be nice if things like the infrastructure me message was a part of, of, of the messaging and you could see that, uh, this is Jamie Harrison's, right? That the dirt road that's been a dirt road is now a uh, paved road. Best out of the cycle. Yeah. 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 So. Don't even knock on my door till you do something about that. I don't right. care what party you're from. Yeah. Exactly. And whatever what everyone, party. Everyone's got a dirt road. Just find out what their dirt road is. Right. That seems like um, a good positive place to stop, right? We're at an hour. This was so much fun. I could oh my do God, it for much longer. So <laughs> I know. That was very fast. Um, so Aaron, can I ask, how can people find you if they want to follow you? Um, on Twitter, it's probably one of the easiest ways. I'm at Arun Chad, A-R-U-N-C-H-A-U-D. Uh, I'm also uh, on Facebook, easily findable, and Instagram, uh, the same handles. And yeah, please reach out to me uh, via any of those things. Always love talking to people and hearing from people. Super. Um, I am thrilled to tell everyone, Aaron has generously agreed to come back again when the lockdown lifts and it's safe to meet in person. So I'm already looking forward to a fun event in the beautifully renovated theater at America House. And as long as we're dreaming, let's throw in maybe a wine reception and some food that we can oh all eat together. God, you're painting a real <laughs> all picture the stuff here. We can't do. <laughs> um, anyway, our next event for our community will also be virtual on March 25th, where we will welcome Robert Solek, the former president of the World Bank mm -hmm. and the US Deputy Secretary of State and Trade Representative under George W. Bush. His new book, if you all wanna have a look at it before we meet, is America in the World, A History of US Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. So we'll talk a bit about the book. Um, and also I wanna take the fact that he was very uh, active in German reunification. So if anyone wants to talk about that, we'll have him there. And I'm sure we'll talk about some current events. So watch our website and the America House website for details. And if you have not already signed up to receive updates, you can do so on our website and we'll make sure to keep you informed. And that is dialoguesondemocracy.com. And the link to tonight, if you miss it or you wanna tell friends about it is also up on our websites. It's this YouTube link and it will stay active so you can pass it on. So I would like to say thank you again to Aran for such a fun conversation tonight. To the America House, Dominique Rabe and Joanna King for handling behind the scenes and the tech. Thank you guys. Do follow their website, um, even locked down, they do have great events in many areas of transatlantic issues, culture, arts, and um, there will again be in-person events as soon as we all can. As always, a huge thank you to our members and supporters who make this program possible with your support of time, talent, and financial donations. So guys, democracy only survives if we all work at it. So I would like to thank those of you who are a part of the Dialogues on Democracy community, the Yale Club, America House community, or if you're just joining tonight to be engaged in a part of the conversation, wherever you are from Pristina and Munich to wherever you are out there, thank you very much for engaging. Stay safe and healthy and hope to see you again on March 25th.